right, welcome back to um, Big Talk. From, <clears throat> excuse me, Big Talk from Small Libraries 2018. I am Krista Porter here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Um, up next on our conference is uh, Craig Anderson, who is the uh, director at the Boundary County Library in Bonners Ferry, Idaho. Good morning, Craig. Good morning. Nice and, to And um, his library is the winner, was the winner, because now we're in 2018, of the 2017 Best Small Library in America Award. Um, this is an award um, from Library Journal Magazine, um, their annual award um, that is um, sponsored by the Junior Library Guild from uh, Division of Library Journal. Um, and this is an award that uh, showcases exemplary work of libraries serving populations under 25,000. And yours is actually quite a bit below that, your population served. Yeah, we're about 11,000 11, in our county. Yeah. Um, and um, Craig is going to tell us about how they got this award, how they created a culture of opportunity at their library um, that then uh, got the attention of this. So I will just hand over to you, Craig, to take away and tell us about your library. All right, for starters, um, boy, I get asked to tell about our library a lot. Um, today's focus, really, um, I would like to make more about you guys, actually. And then I'll give some tidbits about what we did along the way. Um, but really, if you look at the little blurb that was, that was um, on the schedule today, first thing you probably noticed was creating a vision of hope. Hopefully you noticed that. Um, and here's our website. So welcome to Boundary County Library. Hopefully you can see all of this as I'm scrolling along. Is that is that working? Yep, looks good. Yep. Okay. And as we go through, you'll see some pretty interesting pictures of things that we do. But really, My whole focus in my career, my previous career, um, as an educator at Monterey Ferry High School, where I taught for 32 years, was in this novel of life, you are the main character. Not what the teacher thinks you should do. Um, not what, I don't know, a state curriculum maybe tells you to do. Um, however, we did have to follow all those things. But really, especially for seniors getting ready to exit in their lives, it was all about them being the main character and what they would learn how to do. And this is how you really create that culture um, of opportunity. It has to be about the patron. It has to be about the student. It has to be about the people that are coming in the door. <clears throat> Not so much about us, but what we can allow them to see about themselves. So that, that's a huge part of that. And a lot of times people, um, this is going to sound kind of esoteric. I hope this is okay. How am I doing so far? Okay. Great. Awesome. Yep. It's going to sound a little esoteric, but really, um, deep down inside, this is, what, this is what you do when you create this vision of hope. And, um, and this culture of opportunity. I always looked at uh, my previous career and my current career, which I'm only in my second year as a library director, and I already we've got that award. That's still blowing my mind. Um, I am merely holding open a really cool door so that people can just go charging through it. That's my whole focus. That's what I've been thinking about. That's um, what I've been doing. I'm going to continue to do that. I do that with my staff. I do that with people that come in the door, people that come to our fab lab, all of that sort of thing is to do that. And sometimes people don't have that strong vision of hope within themselves. And sometimes they just need to have somebody at their shoulder to allow them to see that they really do, that they really um, have some amazing things inside themselves and they can really give them the right, situation which we're trying to create here at the, our library find all the coolness inside themselves that's what we're we're all about here and you're probably already telling that i'm pretty much a relationship guy i mean that that's really key and a huge part of what we do at boundary county library is we do um we do create this relationship 
um, people come in and you guys are from small libraries. You do this too. I know you do. People come in and you know them by their first name. You know, you're able to to engage with them as human beings. And you know, um, my staff said the other day, you know, um, I don't ever want to go to automated checkout. They said that um, in our little community of Boundary County, our town is about twenty two or twenty three hundred people. Um, if you think of Mayberry. <laughs> In the old Andy Griffith show, that's what we're talking about, um, you know. And so, we just want that personal touch. We're known as, you know, the library with the bear because we have a large stuffed bear in our library, um, and the library with the heart. Those are the things we're known for, and um, that's how you begin that culture of opportunity, is to by building those relationships with people all around you. And, and letting them know that, hey, we're here. You know, we've got some pretty cool things. We invite you to join in those cool things. And let's see how far you can go. And people have gone pretty darn far. Um, people have gone far um, during my teaching career with what they're doing. Um, people are in the process of going pretty darn far with what they're going to be doing in our uh, our library with all the things that we have to offer. So by the way of visuals, hmm, if you look down here, you can see these icons that I'm running the, the mouse along right now. So one of the first things that we did to create a culture of opportunity um, when I began working here in the summer of 2016 was we decided to rebrand ourselves. And you know, we're always looking for things that are measurable, um, definable. Um, I mean, if you want to see measurable, you keep stats on everything. Hopefully you can see that. But as a teacher, I learned how to do that. And I have got an amazing staff member who's a wildlife biologist, and she loves to keep stats on things. So we have all of this that we do that we track. And um, visualizing them like that makes a huge difference to the people you are presenting it to as well. Oh, yeah. And it's great when you go into a board meeting and you have, you know, all these really tall bar graphs, <laughs> you know, about what you've been doing. And, and you know, it's it's pretty cool. Um, so if you're looking at these icons, you can see that we rebranded ourselves. And what we tried to do is um, we tried to create an image of the different things that we do and keep it really simple so that people could understand what they were and people could know exactly where that they could plug into in our library. If you notice the BCL symbol right here, um, each one of the colors corresponds with the color on the rings around on the different parts of the icons. We decided to follow the Star Trek method because, <laughs> you know, we're Really, it's very subtle, though. You would it doesn't scream that, so that's nice. No, no, my no, Catherine Boger, who was our our uh, graphic designer. You know, she and I sat down and we got input from all the staff members, and and uh, we thought, okay, how can we how can we do this? And so, you know, as you see this wheel right here, you're seeing little bits and pieces of all the other ones in there, and uh, it's just like like I said on Star Trek when you have the, you know, you know, everybody's got their little little. Um, communicator there and it has a different uh, symbol inside of it for um, all the different parts of the ship and so this is our ship and so as we kind of scroll down through here um, you can see it's a pretty clean website this is kind of the classic mountain of boundary county it's called clifty and um, everybody looks at it every day as they come into town so that's that culture that's that relationship that's we're all looking at the same thing as we're coming along. And as we roll on down through here, ta-da. OK, that's kind of fun. And uh, you can actually look at the article. You can go to it yourself if you want to. It's on Library Journal, September. And as we go down through here, um, we have so many different kinds of things that are going on. And I'm sure that you're going to hear about this cool stuff all day, which is great, because librarians and libraries are just doing things that if everybody in this world knew about it, they would just be beating down the door of every library, of everyone who's listening and those who aren't. So, I mean, this is totally, totally cool. Um, we decided to have an event called Scary Night that you're looking at right there. Uh, I don't know if you can notice 
that's death right there. I see. <laughs> yes. Over there. Okay. He's telling some really creepy stories to some kids. Oh, that's me underneath that. <laughs> <laughs> that's a persona that I created back when I was a teacher at the high school. But um, <laughs> there's a lot of life and death. I mean, it's not really death. It, it's 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 an opportunity for kids to enjoy and have fun and and. Uh, this thing was so well attended. We started it just this last year on Friday, the 13th of October. And we had at least 60 people just flying in and out of this library all night from, from seven o'clock to nine o'clock that night. It was, it was really amazing. And people were um, hearing stories, they were playing games, they were doing um, story time, they were building their own skeleton, which is where that kind of scientific part of it came in. And yeah. they had, yeah, they had to actually do a scavenger hunt to find all the different bones. And uh, then they found the bones and they were able to glue them on a piece of paper and we had a plastic skeleton that they could look at. So that was the wildlife biology part of it. It's like, okay, here's what's inside of your body. So it's an educational opportunity, which we thought was pretty cool. Um, so yeah, some interesting, fun things that we've been doing. Why do we have an alligator that, well, we have, actually have a 3D printed alligator skull in our lab. Um, down here um, in this area, we have, you'll notice the big screen right here. Um, another opportunity for kids, we do have a polycom system. And so um, we have connection with Alaska Zoo, the Toledo Zoo, and, and we're, we're trying to hook up with the Smithsonian so that we'll actually have FaceTime, kind of how we're doing today with an actual zookeeper talking to the kids and questions and answers and all that good stuff. We used to work with NASA, but they're, they've been, their funding went elsewhere. I think they're going to head back to the moon. So they didn't have enough funding to, to do their That's outreach. Okay, then, I it's guess, a, I guess I'll let them do that. <laughs> total bummer. Um, <laughs> Cause NASA was kind of, there was a big partner for us. That we had. There was a lot of things. I, I've, yeah, a lot of libraries have done, there's partnerships with NASA and bringing in programming and things about space. And of course the most recent eclipse, Oh yeah, we had a Nichols party. That was really fun, and uh, live streaming, and then out in the yard and everything. Even though we're pretty darn far north, we only had eighty percent of totality, so we didn't quite get that. But um, it's neat. It, it's neat to have these kids in here, you know, actually talking to somebody who's talking about how do you go to the bathroom up on the space station, <laughs> you know? And then they think, oh my gosh, look at these opportunities that I'm here in this little tiny town. And this is where I'm going to go back to this this culture of opportunity each time. You know, here I am in this little tiny town, but yet I'm talking to somebody who works, you know, in a zoo or works for, for NASA or maybe the Smithsonian. And, you know, wow, that's a vision of something that I don't usually get every day. And I'm engaged with them. And, oh, wow, maybe I maybe I can go do that stuff. You know, maybe there's a bigger world out there and I can go be part of it. And that's just that's that's, you know, we, our entire staff shares that vision. And so I fit right in really well. Um, it's it's pretty cool, the, the different things that we can do. Um, as we're moving up here into the our website, of course, this one that I'm hovering over right now is our main collection, and then we have story time. Uh, what library doesn't, right? I mean, that's that's such so core to to libraries and what we do. But um, it's interesting to note too that. Right now, the person that sits on the other side of the screen is um, out and about in the community. She is reading to 4-H kids up at the middle school right now. And outreach is one of the most important things that we have done. Um, man, we, we were part of a summer reading program at a local school that um, opens itself during the summer to all these kids. And so we read to them. That's part of our summer reading program. You know, there's so many different ways that you can reach out. For me personally, and I'm not sure how many of folks out there are doing this, but um, for me personally, one of the most valuable outreaches that I do, and I have a volunteer that works with me. Um, he's, a, he's a retired gentleman, a Vietnam vet, um, someone who was searching for some extra meaning in his life. And he came to my office one day and said, I heard you're taking books to the folks over at our, your local restorium, which is a facility for really old people that, you know, can't get out anymore. And he said, I want to be part of that. 
And I said, you're, you're in the boat, Larry. Let's go pick out some books for some people. And so we do. And we go over there and you should see what happens to these people. The, the more that we go visit them, the more present that they become in the room. It's really neat. I'm not sure how many of you guys are doing this, um, but you know, it's, it's one of the most valuable things I've ever done in my entire life. I mean, it really is. When I'm sitting in a room with a gentleman who survived World War II, and what he says about it is, I walked across Europe, and we didn't have it nearly as bad as the guys over in the Pacific. This is, this is the connection. This is that human relationship that forms. And that, you know, it, it, it enriches us. It makes our lives better. But then they have someone to listen, you know, to their stories. You know, I ran into a lady who was a teacher who had actually brought the first microscopes to the children of the island of Palau in the South Pacific after World War II. She didn't even know she had done it until I said, wow, as a teacher, I got to tell you this. Because I was a science teacher, too, and we did a lot with microscopes. Um, I've got to tell you this. I'll bet you that on that island, kids had never looked through microscopes before you brought them there. You did it first. You made history. And, she, you know, this is the great generation. They didn't even, she didn't even think twice about that. You know, it's like, wow, I guess I did, didn't I? And then all of a sudden, this door to, in her life just opened up. And she realized, well, I'm stuck in this place. But you know what? I changed a lot of people's lives. And by telling, telling me that story, now I get to share it with you. See, that just goes on and on and on. And quite amazing, um, the things that we get to do when we do our outreach. So do as much as you can. You know, we bring library. We don't have the budget right now for a vehicle. I know some of you guys do. You're out there with your, with your van bringing books to your community. We do um, library in a box. So, mm -hmm. you know, um, it's, it's amazing what we get to do. We get to, to bring boxes of books that you can just take them or leave them or put, them, put back another one. And we just want to put books in the hands of people and increase their lives. And you guys are doing that too. So talking to the choir here. Um, next one over is our YA section that we're, we're building and, and growing as we go. And um, I think the connection between the YA and the Fab Lab are probably what's really kind of helping that part. And again, you can see the big screen right here um, in that one. Um, and uh, so I do want to focus in here for a bit on the Fab Lab. Um, outreach was one of the reasons that we um, were nominated for a, a small library. Um, our Fab Lab is definitely another big reason that we are doing that. And I'm clicking on this and there it goes. Yep. I went away for a while um, <laughs> from my own view. I'm, hopefully you can see me, but um, yep. you're all good. Am I loud enough? Can oh, I yeah. have a quiet voice? So um, as we go through, I wanted to, for you guys to see what what we have available. And this is where part of that, that culture of opportunity. So when you go on our website, and everybody can do that if they want to, um, you go on down to the machine, machine video courses. And I'm going to do something kind of bizarre. But I'm a teacher, um, so who we can't, happens to work in a library. So you see that? Uh huh. Isn't that weird? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Chain mail. No assembly required. You can get the skills in our lab to make almost. <clears throat> Is that off of a 3D printer? The ch the blue. <laughs> Yes, that was 3D printed. Nice. One printing. We mm -hmm. did this at our county fair. We, we get a booth at the county fair. And I'll tell you what, you want to talk about outreach and connecting with people? At last year at our fair, we had 1,028 visits at our little table. And you put a 3D printer on a table and, and a couple of monitors where people can see what you're designing and some videos about you know, making 3D printed hands for kids and stuff like that. Um, all of a sudden, um, especially for the older generation, just notice all this gray hair, um, <laughs> their whole universe goes, <laughs> and they, they're like, wow, they can do that? And, I, and I'm like, no, no, you, 
you could do that. And so before you know it, they're coming in for a fab tour and they're getting to see all the stuff that we have. And so in the picture there, you can see this is kind of the outer glass uh, enclosure to our, our outer office. And when we roll inside of there, okay, these are the machines that we actually have in our lab. And this is why it's called a fab lab because, and I need to go back just a bit here. This is why it's called a fab lab because we have, and this is thank you to my predecessor, Sandy Ashworth. She was the director here for 20 years and worked in the library for 12 more before that. And she had this amazing epiphany that if you put a technical center up for education in your library, in your community, and let everybody come use it, it's going to be like this flower and people are gonna blossom out because they're gonna be able to use things that they couldn't afford to have in their homes. And I and see that you have different models of 3D printers in there. We have, we have three 3D printers, mm -hmm. two Affinias, the 480, the 800, and we have just recently, with some of the prize money that we got, um, we've got the Ultimaker 3, which is an amazing printer. Mm -hmm. You can actually print with two colors at the same time. Oh. So I'm not sure how, if you, you guys all know how 3D printing works. A lot of libraries are doing it now, so you probably do. And you can YouTube it and watch it and, and see all these things. So 3D printing is kind of becoming the norm in the big libraries anyway. Um, people in the small libraries of Idaho have been calling me and, and saying, well, you know, what did you guys do and how did you get this? And um, Sandy wrote two amazingly huge grants, mm -hmm. tune of $90,000 total. One of them was Idaho Gym through the Department of Commerce for the state of Idaho. The other one was a USDA Rural Development Grant. Mm -hmm. And... Even though the deadline had passed, they believed in what we were doing so much that they actually harvested unused funds from other states to put together like $45,000. And so right. in that original picture that you saw that with the glass wall, that was actually storage in our, our, our youth librarian's office area before. And so a lot of materials out in the storage unit now, kind of a bummer for that material, but um, we have a fab lab. And so as I scroll down here, you can see what else, what really sets us apart from other libraries is this thing right here. This is the epilogue laser and it looks small in the picture, but it's not. Um, we don't take that one to the fair because, you know, it's, it would fill up part of a pickup bed. It's pretty good sized and it's too heavy to be lugging around. But with that, um, the amazing things that you can create, um, you know, we've got, This is a family tree. Oh, nice. And we have another one. And is that, that's on wood? Yeah, this is on sure. wood. But we have another one that is on, it's on acrylic. And, and I wish I could, it wouldn't look very good in here because it's, there's a lot of light in my office right now. But when we edge light it, you can see all the people's names mm -hmm. and and everything the light comes through and so when you turn the lights down you get this amazing view of this family tree um we've got another one of an angel we've got another one of an activity scene that made huge waves at a local um, church gathering this this winter when they had all these nativity scenes on display and everybody's like you know then it's on social media that came from bounty county library and so that outreach and that holding that door open and saying, okay, time for you guys to show up and go charging through. You can learn how to use this thing, you know, and it doesn't, it's not that difficult and it goes really well. We also have um, a desktop Roland milling machine, which is kind of like a small CNC machine that sits on top of the, a, ca uh, a cabinet. And then the ShopBot Buddy, which is really actually bigger than this. This guy's as big as Sasquatch right here, you guys. Um, <laughs> It's a lot bigger than that. And so, I mean, if you had, let's say, furniture pieces 
or uh, a beautiful sign that you wanted to make with scroll work. Or maybe you had the idea of an electric guitar body that no one else had that shape. You know, mm -hmm. I can see this on my, you know, that's a guitar right there because that's, mm -hmm. I play guitar for kids here. So, so I always go there. Um, but you could make all these different possi possibilities. And then, of course, you know, this one right here, um, vinyl cutters are pretty common. A lot of mm -hmm. t-shirt shops have them. And, uh, but we have one and what I encourage people to do is think about these skills that you're learning, go into rapid prototyping, take an idea that is intellectual property, be able to make the model of it without having to risk going elsewhere with that. Um, and there are, there actually are 3D printing and other shops around that are, you know, commercial. So you learn the skills in ours, you know, go there, um, down to Sandpoint, 30 miles away or whatever, or Coeur d'Alene, um, that's about 60 miles away. And then you can start a, start a business. And when we go to the Fab Symbo Symposium around um, the United States, because we're part of the Fab Foundation through MIT, um, oh. A worldwide organization. This is the this is actually the the grocery list of machines that you need to have to be affiliated through the Fab Foundation and and which is connected to MIT. Um, grant money, right? Go Sandy. Um, so once you are able to do that, what happens is instead of taking years and years to start a business and untold thousands of dollars, it has been determined by people um, in the Fab um, kind of the business of Fab that you can do this for maybe six months and three thousand dollars and then be starting to launch a business based on some intellectual property that you had in your mind for years but mm -hmm. never was able to turn it into a reality that's a culture of opportunity it really is i mean inviting yeah, them the chance to just even try out these things that they would have never been able to themselves mm -hmm. have access to we have classes for the CAD classes, so you can actually, or for the, the, the CAD programs, so you can actually learn how to how to design your own things. People start off with um, a program called Thingiverse, and everybody can go on that, T-H-I-N-G-I-verse, yep. and there are thousands of free downloadable legal designs, and people will start with those, and then they'll you know put them on the screen, and then they'll morph them, change them a little bit, and little by little, they're actually learning the, the, the Tinkercad program, or CorelDRAW. You know, we offer several. And so then you can do that. And if you want to learn how to do more, then you go on lynda.com. We have lynda, L-Y-N-D-A.com. And you can take literally thousands of different classes. So you can learn all these different CAD programs. You can learn marketing. You can learn filmmaking. You name it. And since we're paying the bill, it doesn't cost you 30 to $40 a month to, to do it. And you can use your own a, a device or computer at home. And we actually do have a question about, um, I, I guess, many, many of these machines here. Um, someone wants to know, I figured I'd jump in now because you were talking about them now. Um, sure. Do oh. you charge for the materials or the use of these? Um, okay. Things like, you know, the, 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 you know the, the filament that goes in the 3D printer, the wood, the whatever. Yeah. How do you, how do you, how you do that? Okay. So the answer is no, we don't charge for that. Um, uh, one of the things that I had on, on my little blurb there that's on your website is uh, foster understanding in your stakeholders. Mm -hmm. And stakeholders are kind of everybody because it's not my library, it's everyone's library. But the stakeholders that I'm referencing there are our board members. And here in Boundary County, we have a separate library board. So I don't have to go to the county commissioners or, or anything else. I, we have an actual library board and five members from different zones around our county. And then we meet once a month and we discuss some, you know, how this place works and what we want to do and our dreams for the future. And, you know, how, where do we want to go with this? Because it's amazing and it's probably going to become more amazing. You know, like I said, this is the year two for me. So <laughs> I'm still overwhelmed. I'm still kind of blown away by the fact that I'm even on this screen right now. But, um, <laughs> but I'm really happy to be here. Um, so stakeholders, the, so um, upkeep for the machines, um, equipment budget, um, 
materials, all that is, that's a line item in our budget. All right. Mm -hmm. And so when we're developing budget, you know, each spring, then we make sure that that's properly funded. And, uh, and someone has a, has a specific question. Is there a huge increase in, and I just something I had never thought about with uh, people doing all these makerspace and fab labs, um, increase in the cost of your electricity bill because of all these different things that are plugged in. Is that anything negligible really? You know, I've thought about that a lot, actually. And that, that's a valid, valid question. Yeah. Um, Right now, due to staffing, our classes are only open on Monday and Friday. If we were cranking, you know, six days a week, yeah, I would see that that happening. But um, we're, we're Monday and Friday. Our hours are long. Um, we are open from 9 to 8 on Monday and 9 to 8 on Friday. Um, classes go from 1 to 3, 3 to 5, and 5 to 7, and then that gives staff the last hour to get back upstairs and help with the circulation desk and because everybody wears all the hats, you know, we do have certain people that are tech ed that just teach those classes to people that do that um, primarily. And then a third that kind of supports them um, and helps with uh, CAD programs, teaching those. And, uh, but you know, you have to roll back in and start putting them, you know, shutting down. You guys know how that works. Mm -hmm. you go through your checklist. And so that's why we turn that off at seven. And so six classes a week, uh, we're rolling into um, a Tuesday afternoon for 3D printing for people who are certified. Um, that means that the instructor has um, given, they know that the person is not going to ruin the machine, that they're gonna be safe, you know, cause we, you know, we had to develop a safety program um, on our website here. When you click on the different machines, you're gonna have to actually go through and watch tutorial videos take a safety quiz, just like in high school yeah, or middle school, you know, and sign your patron agreement, which I actually had our city attorney go through and make sure it was, yeah. solid, you know, so you have to cover everything, you know, and you know which parts I'm talking about. Um, mm -hmm. And so when, when they're ready, then they can come in with minimal supervision. There's always going to be somebody kind of walking through the lab and checking on them, but they can make things on Tuesday afternoons as well. So, but no, our, um, our electrical bills hasn't haven't really jumped hugely yet. Nice. Uh, yeah. yeah. What really makes things jump around here is weather. Ah, yeah. I out my window right now, you know, there's like a foot of snow right outside, right, you know, right out there. So, so that's what really, you know, as far as natural gas and electrical and that sort of thing. It's the, mm -hmm. the weather that has the biggest, you know. Now, would you ever allow, someone wants to know, people to, can they also bring in their own materials to use in some of these machines? And obviously like maybe the wood or whatever. Yeah, if they want to, yes, people do. And, but they, we have a strict um, um, inspection of the piece of, of wood because, you know, if you're using, you know, like the CNC machine, the big one, I mean, you've got a high speed bit that's spinning right here. And if it hit a nail or a screw or something that was in that piece of wood, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, we're talking destruction of the, the property here and potential hazard for people. Right, of course, yeah. I mean, this is full on wood shop machine right here. So yeah, there's a strict inspection that we do on anything that anybody wants to bring. <laughs> that is bringing their stuff in she's mm -hmm. making a really cool bottle opener um wall hangers with uh and yeah. using the laser to get her there she created a monogram for their family and i mean it's really neat what's starting to happen with this stuff so and the sky's the limit every time somebody thinks of something somebody else has to think of something else <laughs> and then it goes bigger and bigger and bigger you know of course. Now, um, someone else know, obviously, um, actually, there's a couple of kind of related questions here, I think. Um, this person says the small libraries in their state don't have the funding to afford these kind of things, of course, or mm -hmm. um, also the space to house them. Um, now, you mentioned with the funding that you did that um, your predecessor had applied for grants to help get this going. Yep. In the first place. And then um, the, go ahead. Because we needed to repurpose the back part of our basement. Mm -hmm. you know? So. So look for grants out there. I mean, there are funding other things that um, 
Mm -hmm. uh, you, but now you have it as an ongoing budget item because you have brought in the library board to be very supportive of. They were in want. there yeah. even before the whole thing started. I mean, they were cheering Sandy on all the way. And so was I, you know, I was starting to volunteer here and everything even before I left the high school. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I was, I'd come in and visit her and, you know, she'd, you know, be asking questions about, well, should I do this and should I do that? And how do we move forward? And I'm like, you can do it. You can do it. You're, you know, a little engine that could basically, <laughs> it does. It's, you know, that it's kind of mm -hmm. cliche now, the, the thing about it, it takes a village, but, you know, it mm -hmm. takes a, a town to build a library too. And that means people that are just, the moral support is tremendous. Absolutely. You know? You have to have it because otherwise you're not going to be having that vision of hope that you can sustain, you know? Um, the other thing that I said about developing a solid plan, Sandy did that. She, she developed this plan of, of creating, basically she wanted to create a big business center, educational center. And I actually was on um, a committee. We tried to float a bond for an $8 million building. And in an economically depressed community, if I could see everybody out there, I can't, but you could, if you could raise your hand and say, okay, I'm from an economically depressed small library community, I'd probably be seeing a forest Betty, of hands yeah. out there. Um, so yeah, we, that thing went down in flames so hot that it would make your head spin. And so, but Sandy, all she did was, you know, she reached in this drawer right here and she pulled out her tape measure and said, nope, I'm not taking no for an answer on this one. And she looked at the back part of the basement back there, said, Terry, we're moving your office. And, you know, Lynn and Diana, we're going to move these books that are in storage elsewhere. And that are, we're in the very back by the, under the stairwell. Mm -hmm. And we're going to build a fab lab. So, and that's a huge part of it. It's just having a really hard head and not not taking no for an answer. Even though you know it's not the building, we were going to just replace this entire thing. And of course, this building was finished in 1974. And people in our community are like, "Wait a minute, you can't replace that building. It's the newest building in down the downtown area." <laughs> 1974. <laughs> so there's no way you're going to tear that down. And we're going to put the books in the meantime and blah blah, blah and all this stuff. And you know, so it crashed and burned. But um, but just, you know, picking yourself up, you know, like in a Disney cartoon, dusting mm -hmm. yourself off and starting all over again. And, mm -hmm. you know, but having people around you that say, you know, you can do this. And I was one of those people. Yeah. And now I'm here. And, you know, as we move forward, there's going to be people around me saying the same thing to me. Because there will be times, and you guys all know, right? There, there are times when, like, you know, the last presenter, wow, okay, here's some things that happened. We're going to do it this way next time, you know, and uh, but you do have to have people, you know, rah, rah, cheering you on to do that. But, you know, um, that solid plan, you know, having um, point A to point B to point C and on down the line. And then, of course, you know, she built the Fab Lab, but she didn't open it. That, hmm. It wasn't open. And she retired and I took over and I said, well, you know, during my interview for this job, they said, what's, what's your first objective? What are you going to do in your first 60 days? You know, that's a question that is asked. And I said, we're opening, we're going to open the Fab Lab. That's the first thing we're going to do. And we did. And, you know, I started officially in October, 1st of October. That's when our fiscal year starts. And by mid-November, we had students. Nice. That's we fast. Teach without students, right? So um, that's, yeah. We put together all the paperwork, you know, um, uh, my crew went on lynda.com and learned how to use the machines. And I've got some really apt folks that really wanted to, they'd been wanting to get in there for a while. So they'd been preparing and, mm -hmm. and learning and, and, and playing in the lab. And it really is playing. Um, and it was just a matter of me opening the gate and letting them come running out. And boy, they did. And then, you know, when you start doing these events like the craft fair, and the hospital fair and the county fair and you're out there in the community and you're you know and before you know it you've got all these grade school kids coming through and you know you're you're making little tokens for them mm -hmm. you know with your laser and you're handing them out you know out of even we found out that we can actually laser on tortillas <laughs> really okay yeah. 
I don't think I've ever seen that done yet. <laughs> you can do it on toast, tortillas. Sure. Can, yeah. <laughs> so um, cardboard is really cheap and there's lots of it. So if you get, ever get a laser, you can give away tons of little counters that, about your library and just give them away to people, you know, um, quite amazing. I had my first intern that I hired was a student in my class before and he had a 3D printer at home. And so um, he knew how to do it. He taught us a ton of stuff. He designed this on yeah. Blender, which is a free open source um, web page that is used for character design for video game characters. Ah, right. He was really into that. He's going into film right now and he's going to make, you know, 3D generated characters, you know, like in all these movies that you see, the superhero movies and all that sort of stuff. You have all this 3D generated stuff. So he's working on that right now in college. So we lost him, darn. But um, he taught us how to use a lot of the parts of the lab, actually. Mm. So his dad totally believed in the in the present and the future and kids, and they, they had a 3D printer at home. And another one that makes pancakes, but <laughs> on a griddle. 3D prints pancakes. But anyway, oh, I've seen story. videos of that. Yes, yes, 3D pancakes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, think of Scooby Doo with all the details of all the spots on him because the parts that hit the griddle first are cooked more. Mm -hmm. So they're darker. And so you get the coloration of the pancake. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's really fun. But, all right. So, uh, we have a question about something that's not. The, I know you have lots of things you do, not just this this Fab Lab that we're kind of focusing on here. So we did have a question you had mentioned earlier about doing the um, the program with zookeepers and NASA. Yes. What was mm -hmm. the name of the system you Polycom. used to do that? It's a Polycom system. Polycom. Okay. Mm -hmm. And you can go online and check out Polycom. Um, yeah, they do hand me a pretty big invoice, you know, but that is again part of our budget mm -hmm. um, and someone did ask and uh, how big is your budget that we're talking here for your library um, or county library so if people have to remember that this is a you serve the entire county sure you're 11,000 some odd um, yeah. yeah almost so, 12,000 po um, population served it's like 314 um, ish <laughs> yeah it's I don't know if that answers that question very well, okay. but um, so it's not huge, but mm -hmm. it's the way that it's broken up, you know, yeah. you know, we have certain things we emphasize more than others and, and uh, it's the way that it's broken up and, and we, we appropriate funds. Mm -hmm. so. Other questions? I see that, I mean, we are getting, I could talk about this library all day, but you know, <laughs> Um, someone has actually a good question that I think uh, many people may be wondering about something because you did mention, and we have that here too in, in Nebraska libraries, um, when you have these uh, this kind of equipment or anything like this in the library, having this specific training and certification so that people know how to use them safely, mm -hmm. both use them correctly, both for their own safety and, as you said, so they don't break anything. Um, right. What about um, your liability insurance? Did you have to do something special to cover this new equipment or is that something that is already part of what you already had how does that yeah, work we're part, of, we're part of what's called icrimp and it's the state of idaho you know all the all the entities like us in the state of idaho form a group so it's a pretty large um you know insurance pool oh okay so as we embarked on this you know we you know i, I we have put together a, a much more complete um inventory which i sent to our our adjuster here in town, who was my 11th grade physics or, um, civics teacher. <laughs> we all know each other. Um, <laughs> and so, yeah, um, that's just part of that. It's part of our, our eye cramp. And, and we've got a state of Idaho liability insurance policy, too, that this is all mm -hmm. part of that, too. Right. So, huh? Yep. So that's taken care of with that umbrella. You know, I've got to say that one of my tech educators when you first was you know setting up the the shop uh, the bits are razor sharp that fits in here mm. and so he just ran he was just sweeping off the this deck right here where this little finger is going and he barely touched that bit with the back of his hand and he went to the hospital so i got oh, to, no. to fill out that paperwork you know and so they paid for 
or Wallace had paid for his visit. So it's not like things don't happen. And then we had a big training session with all the staff members and everything. And, but I had a training day here. You know, we learned CPR and all that sort of thing. And so the more of that kind of thing that you do, you know, with your staff, uh, your risk tends to go down because you're demonstrating a risk management. And that's a huge part of what we do. Um, and someone has a question that I think might be, you said that your, your fab lab and all this equipment is in a basement space in your library. Yes, correct? Yeah. They wanted to know how do you handle the noise that comes with the machines, but is it because it's in the basement that kind of takes care of it in your case? No, because I'm in the basement right now, actually. Um, it's just, <laughs> you know, um, we're, okay, it's just that way. But um, <laughs> um, it's quite amazing. We have, when Sandy first designed the remodel, there are three different areas. There's the outer office, which you saw in the picture. Um, and then that's where the computer part is, where you can do the computer training and you can do learn your CAD classes and, and get your designs uh, downloaded to a file that you can send to your 3D printer or send to the laser. Um, you can get all that there. And then there's another room behind that. And that's where the 3D printing takes place. And 3D printing is not very loud. I mean, a no, lot of you guys not, know that. No. It's, it's a real quiet thing. And then, then behind that one, there's another door. And you go behind into the other shop. And that's, that's where um, these things. Now, the laser is really quiet. You know, the loudest part of the laser, because mm -hmm. it's a light. It's like you're clicking a flashlight on, you know, um, a thousand times per second or something. You know, it's mm -hmm. quite amazing. So there's not much noise involved. Um, and we do have, we did have to create a venting system because you do have some of that burnt dust from whatever it is you're lazing. And so it's vents outside to the outside of the building. So that's some a requirement there. Uh, the vinyl cutter doesn't really make any, any noise. It's just, I don't know if you guys have seen these probably in the t-shirt shops, but it's just um, a sharp blade right here that just moves back and forth this way. And then the material slides in and out this way. So you get your X and your Y axis, and then it just moves back and forth. It's really quiet. And um, this is a little bit louder because um, it's a high speed bit that's just, but it's, so, it's, it's right kind of under the stairwell that you take to get downstairs. So it's way in the back. And then this one is towards the back too. And the loudest part of this thing, believe it or not, is that there's a big dust collection device is like this huge shop vac that sits next to it there is yeah there's a lot of extra things beyond these 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 equipment sometimes that you have to have yeah when that comes on all you hear is it sounds like it sounds like an ac unit in your in your building coming on that's what that sounds like it's kind of a whoosh because you're actually hearing the suction more than you're hearing the bit so yeah i you know i thought oh we should do a sound test I mean, during the off hours so that we can find out, you know, from upstairs how it's going to be. And, um, nope, the dance class that was back in our little conference room was actually way louder than that. <laughs> People on the computers upstairs could hear the boom box when they're, when they're doing their interpretive dance down there. But that's something else we do, let people do that stuff. We have a little room for crafts and meetings and, and interpretive dance in the back. <laughs> kind of cool. So... So no, it's not that loud. I thought it was going to be, but it's it's not. Um, nice. All right. Yeah, lucky. <laughs> um, one other question about these: if a small library who has small space, small budget, um, or just you know, enough budget for one thing, what one if they were able to buy one piece of equipment for their lab, what would you recommend? It's just the yeah, it's one thing to start with, or this guy right here. And I guess I can't can't plug it. Right, because I don't work for Affinia, but a small 3D printer. Mm -hmm. You know, this one, if you bought it now, since it's this one's not the the newest model in the world, 700 mm -hmm. bucks for that guy. The Affinia, the H8480 there on the left. Yep, about 700 that you could get that one. This newest one we got was over three grand, mm -hmm. but it is so nice. I mean, it's got an onboard camera system so that if we're doing um, projects um, that we're doing. Uh, Derek, who's our, our IT guy, can actually, on his phone, up in his office, watch the print. We nice. Just, to yeah. monitor it. Uh-huh. Yeah, it's got an onboard camera that, that's Wi-Fi to his phone or his mm -hmm. computer. And so he, if it, you know, if, if there's going to be a failed print or something, he can just run downstairs and, 
and turn it off real quick. Because you know you get failed prints with any printer. It happens. Oh yes. So, but yeah, that's here's why I would get this first, because um, these the the laser, the the milling machine, the buddy, um, these are subtractive technologies. Anybody with a ham with a you know a handsaw and a board is using subtractive technology. You're lopping something off, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, cutting something to make something else. And this is something that everyone is so familiar with, it's no big deal to them. I mean, it's cool beyond belief, and the laser is awesome. But um, this sparks the imagination. This, when a, a person sees this build space right here, and there's nothing on it, and then they watch, and, you know, a little bit later, you know, something. they're going like this. Yeah. You know, and it's like, oh, my gosh. And, you know, when you're, like, at a county fair or – you know, a place like that, and people, you know, they, they watch the beginning of it, and they go look at the goats for a while, and they come back, and there's more of it done, and so on, until they come back, and it's completely done. And as they're watching that build, this is a Star Trek feel. It mm. really is. The imagination of the person who's watching that, um, it just goes, you know, it's, it, you get on fire. We, there was this one young, young gal, she was like 12 years old, and she came to our table, and She's looking at this and she's just mesmerized. And I said, hey, you want to see how it works? You know, and so I hopped out and um, Daniel, my intern, was there at the computer. And she sat down at the computer there next to him. And she turned to him and she said, I'm going to be an engineer. That's what wow. I'm going to be an engineer. And then she dragged her whole family back later on. <laughs> and said, so mom and dad, you know, we need to start saving money because, you know, I'm going to go to MIT or I'm going to go be an engineer. And see, this is huge because more and more young ladies need to get into science and need to get, mm -hmm. you know, break that glass ceiling. I'm a dad of a daughter. Let's break it. You know, I get that. So, and this is that culture of opportunity. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. we provided the opportunity. She provided the desire. And mm -hmm. by golly, you know, she's going to go do something and it's going to be really sweet. So that's that's what this is really all about, you know. And yeah. I have that in, in my mind. Um, it's contagious within my staff. You know, I do do this stuff all the time with them, you know. And uh, we talk it up amongst ourselves, and then we talk it that up. That first 3D them. printer that you're mentioning there, the one that's the older one. How big? How much space does that take up for a this library one? with not a lot of room to do something? Okay, it's about is that a smaller one. Yeah. Yeah, it can fit on top of this table that my computer's on. All right. With the, mm -hmm, it's small. Most 3D printers are not more than like a foot or two, if that dimensions. Yeah, yeah, yeah less than that even. And if you want to know more about it, you can YouTube it and, and watch you know, it building. That's pretty easy. This one's a little bit bigger, and then this one's bigger yet. This one right. you take up, you know, the top of a counter space. But they're all countertop, all of them. They are, yes. So really, yeah. Um, I did talk to one librarian that said, man, I don't even have enough room for even an extra table, but my board wants me to have a 3D printer now because they read about you guys. And <laughs> and All right. you oh my, I felt kind of bad because they're really putting a lot of pressure on her to get this done. And, hmm. and another lady came for miles and miles to come up to visit us just to, she was a board member and she wanted to talk the, talk the other board members into getting at least one 3D printer in their library it's a small small little community between um, bonners ferry and moscow idaho okay. about 90 miles away she came up here to to check us out so kind of cool that's great awesome it's been like all right that. we're almost at the end of the time do you have any last uh, minute or so last words for everybody before we uh, wrap up your session man it's just right where it started you know with it needs to be about you you know, as a librarian, as a library director, it needs to be about you, and then you turn it around and you make it about the patrons, because they're your students. And picking out the right book, you know, having a story read to a kid, and then that kid will probably read a story to their kid, you know. And it's about that holding up this really cool mirror and letting people see how cool they really are. That's what it's about. And then you just make a place. Where they can do that and i know you guys are all doing that and but it doesn't hurt to have you know an old teacher doing a little cheerleading i mean i did that for 
a long time and kids kids created things you know i had this business project that i had going and during the 16 years i taught that class um, as kids created these projects and it's an entire portfolio and i'm going to give that opportunity for people who go through our fab lab they can learn how to make their own business cards and all that good stuff you know what, what we did before and brochures and web page and all that sort of thing but during the 16 years that i taught that class you know eight eight kids went on to start up their own businesses one of them was called under the sun in bonners ferry you can look that up online it was voted the most innovative small business in the state of idaho and that's what's so, about planting the seed for them absolutely that's what you do and that's what we're doing i did that at the high school i'm going to continue to do that here mm -hmm. and uh, my staff's going to do that and you guys are going to do that you're doing it already but it just needs to be mindful you know it's like okay we show up to work we're doing the things that we always do but it's mindful it's like okay this is what we're really doing and it's going to be really really big mm -hmm. hopefully that helps Absolutely. Yes. Great. Well, thank you so much, Craig. And congratulations to you and your library and your staff and your town for this great honor from Best Small Library in America. Yeah, the um, state legislators right now are making a proclamation for us. It's gone through the House. It's okay. going to go through the Senate. We'll have a statewide proclamation in honor of our library. We're the gem state, so they're mm -hmm. going to say that we're a gem of Idaho. So. <laughs> I'm not sure how that happened. I guess I go down to Boise and I talk to people like I'm talking to you guys and they get excited. Mm, yes. <laughs> so you need to go do that. Go get excited and make things huge. Start mm. small and then get mm. bigger. Absolutely. You can do this. All right. Okay. Well, thank you very much for being with us this morning, Craig. Um, <laughs> so, yeah. So thank you for having me. This has been a real pleasure and honor. Mm -hmm. Take care. Thank you. All right, I am gonna pull back to my screen here now. Oops, there we go. All right, so that is that wraps up for Craig's presentation today. Um, we are recording all day, so if you, um, you miss anything, you wanna go back and see anything, you will be able to um, watch it later. Um, we also have a link to the um, his library's website here, so you can go and see more about what they're doing there, and a link to the article from uh, Library Journal about the Best Small Library in America, so you can read up on exactly all the details about what they were doing there and how they earned that honor.